I reckon we can all agree that Pokemon games are easy. With the target demographic of the franchise being literal fetuses, Game Freak has opted to approach these games focused on pleasing the youth of today. Even with self-imposed rules, these games are still too easy to beat. So, people like me and you turn to fan-made ROM hacks like Radical Red and Renegade Platinum. But even those games are just using the same boring shit Game Freak recycles every single game. Beat 8 gyms, battle evil team, and then become champion. But what if there was a game that didn't do that? Like, what if there was a game that brings something new and exciting to the table? Introducing Pokemon Unbound, the Pokemon game that Game Freak wishes they could create. This game is a full-on custom ROM hack that features its own story, new gimmicks, stupidly tough boss fights, and much, much more. Pretty much anything that you could think of that you want in a Pokemon game is probably in this game. And of course, the Radical Red champ myself will be nuzlocking the insane mode of this game, which features a ton of difficult battles and an AI that will literally cheat to screw you over. I'll talk more about this later. Join me as I embark on a new journey in a fictional world abundant in some of the most challenging obstacles to be ever featured in a Pokemon game. This is the Pokemon Unbound Hardcore Nuzlocke. Let's talk about the starters. In this game, the starters you pick are Beldum, Lavatar, and Gibble. You know it's a great game when the game gives you a pseudo-legendary for a starter, but as far as how good they are, Beldum is fairly consistent throughout the whole game, while Lavatar helps a lot during the hardest part. As for Gibble though, it's absolute dog shit. After trying all three starters for a bit, I decided to run Lavatar. So we grabbed our little buddy and we started our journey trying to defeat Pokemon Unbound. So far, everything is looking pretty fine. The rival was piss easy and none of these random trainers were difficult either. But then we meet our first, uh, challenge of the run. Meet the first gym leader, Mercigal, a hippie that's always smoking some good shit. Well, it's so good that his gimmick is that he creates permanent, uh, fog in his gym. This results in the most annoying and frustrating fight in the game, because all your moves keep missing while his shitty little gloom keeps greening you out. This is why I'll never come to America. Anyways, this isn't the hardest part, because we go deep inside of a volcano where we meet our first run killer of the game. Team Shadow Marlin, or what I like to call Volcano Tag. A tag battle with some dude named Jax that is the most bullshit thing in existence. Not only your partner is absolutely rubbish, but most of the Pokemon you have access to at this point are fucking dog shit, so you really don't have any options. So I spent many hours trying to find a consistent strat to beat this tag fight with a lot of trial and error, resetting from bag to tag over and over again, here's what I found. Basically, you have a chance to get a Rabombi at Flower Paradise, which can one-shot everything on the left, leaving two Pokemon in the back to take care of the rest. When I don't get a B, you usually have another Fairy in Flower Paradise. Along with that, I have Crobat and my starter Lavatar, where Crobat can deal with the Krook, Lavatar dealing with the Swoobat with Rock Tomb and Bite, and the Fairy dealing with everything on the left side, with Crobat in the back to clean up. Oh, and something I should mention here is that every boss fight in this game has fully fledged out teams with competitive movesets and EVs. So the game really forces you to customize your team for every fight, which is something I'm really fond of. Cause it makes you feel hella smart, like those VGC players or those Smogon cucks. But rather than spending countless hours grinding for EVs just to beat one fight, I'm playing on sandbox mode where the game gives you a hub that'll instantly customize your Pokemon to your heart's desire. And if any unbound gatekeeping prick comes in and says, Stefan, that's cheating. It removes the whole challenge of it. Well, you can go and suck my big fat hairy ch- Anyways, we're off to get our second gym badge at Craytown, where we encountered the most broken Pokemon in the game. Don't let this thing deceive you. Clefable having access to setup and soft build makes it so you can 1v1 a lot of stuff with good EV investment. The only issue is to get Clefable, you gotta do a lot of mining. I mean, a lot of mining. It's absolutely f that to spend upwards of 40 fucking minutes to get a shitty little rock. Oh, oh, oh my god! Holy shit, please! Yes! Oh my god, finally! Honestly, if that doesn't show determination, I don't know what will. Anyways, meet the second gym leader, CIA agent Vega. This James Bond looking cunt is a master of dark types, and for some reason, he has a f***ing mega absol at the second gym. Talk about the game being fair to the player. 
Not only that, Vega also extrudes negative energy on the field, which means that all Pokemon take 14% of damage every turn, which is absolutely f***ed, especially when you and the AI are switching constantly. And the only way to get around his negative energy is to have Dark, Ghost, or Psychic type Pokemon because they are immune. Plus, Pokemon with Unaware, Oblivious, and Magikarp are also immune. But this is where the hours of mining was worth it because this pink blob absolutely shits on this gym. Clef having Magic Guard makes it so that it's immune to the negative energy. So what you can do is pre-poison Clef to avoid Lipart's Thunder Wave and give it enough speed EVs to outspeed the Ponyard. And you can set up on the cat and sweep just like that. Easy, deathless, suck my dick, Vega. I just want to say the bad guys in this game are kind of weird because for some reason they like to kidnap 10 year olds and take pleasure in dogs bending them over. Not gonna lie, this is probably the weirdest kink I've ever seen in my life. Speaking of kinks, I have a little kink for people hitting that subscribe button. Something about it really turns me on. But something that doesn't turn me hard is this fucking cold weather. As someone who is from the great land down under, this shit sucks. Anyways, we made it to Blizzard City without dying of hypothermia to face the third gym leader, Alice. Alice has a bunch of bird Pokemon, so not that threatening, right? Wrong. This bitch has permanent Delta Storm on the field, removing all of her flying type weaknesses. Not only that, all flying types get permanent Tailwind, so you're almost never outspeeding a Pokemon. These gimmicks are just getting out of hand, and it's the reason why Alice is one of the biggest run enders in the game. Even I've lost to her a few times. But anyways, here's how the fight went down. I leave Gyarados on the Skarmory, and I use Whirlpool to trap him before killing it off. This baits Dodrio, and I purposely went itemless Gyarados to avoid knockoff and switched in Steelix on the Brave Bird. Since the Dodrio is locked into Brave Bird, I predicted it would swap, so I used this opportunity to set up rocks. Then I go into Clef on the Gliscor and heal as Al swaps into Crobat. Thanks to Stealth Rock, Swoopat comes in and kills this Crobat with Synchronoise. Then Gliscor comes in and Clef uses this opportunity to set up and kill both Gliscor and Pinsir. Last but not least, I didn't want to risk the crit on this bird, so I swapped into Steelix and finished it off. And that's how you beat Alice. You know how most Nuzlocks go after being the third gym? The game opens up so much that the player gains a ton of resources to use to destroy anything in this path. New encounters, citrus berries, the good rod, and the most important item of all, the protect TM. This little disc contains the most broken move in the whole game because there's something about this AI that may be a little bit concerning. Allow me to explain. As previously mentioned in the video, the AI in this game cheats. What I mean by that is that the AI can read your inputs and make decisions that will counter anything that you do. It doesn't happen immediately though. So to trigger the cheat AI, you basically just switch three times. That's it. Switching three times in a row will make any trainer into a Dark Souls boss on crack until you attack. It's pretty absurd if you ask me. Another thing to note is that if one of the Pokemon you have switching has Intimidate, those three switches will turn into two. And that makes so many Pokemon like Gyarados unusable. But this is where the Protect TM comes in. Because if you click Protect every second turn, you will never trigger the Cheat AI because you aren't switching three times in a row. There are a couple of other things that the AI does to cheat. Like in tag battles, the AI reads your turn one inputs by default and the AI knows exactly when Quick Claw will proc. It's just these little things you gotta remember if you wanna run this game yourself. But anyways, after we beat some Team Shadow dudes, we are confronted with the best character in the game. Meet Sexy Mel, a shirtless cowboy that has the sexiest rock hard abs in Pokemon. You know that anime waifu you've been tossing off to? Well, I guarantee you that she's been getting down by this guy. Anyways, Mel is a pretty terrifying team. Just like Radical Red, the Mega Kangaskhan with Parental Bond Power Punch is such a pain to go through. Plus, Mel's Swellow is pre burnt so its guts ability gets activated. But do you know what the real kicker is to this fight? This is an inverse battle, so everything you know about Pokemon is flipped upside down. This is such a problem, because this means that normal Pokemon's only weakness is Ghost, but at the same time, Ghost Pokemon are weak to normal, and there really isn't a type that resists normal either. Fortunately, you do get access to Chillin' Berries at this point, which is a huge help for this fight. I leave Crobat on the Porygon to instantly one-shot it with a gem-boosted Brave Bird and then a bait Snorlax. I switch in Source Buck, which pretty much walls this with its Sap Super ability, and it can charm it down if it sets up. But Snorlax uses Whirlwind and switches out Crawdon. But I just swap the deer back in, and eventually Lax swaps into Kangaskhan as I charm. Clef with the Rocky Helmet slowly chips this thing down before Mel sends out Snorlax again. So then the deer does its thing before Mel sends out Type Null. Clef again sits on this thing, and uses this opportunity to set up before killing this and the Swallow. 
Then Mel sends out Lax again, and a tank swarm before it uses Whirlwind and forces Crobat out. But the deer does not care, and eventually Mel swaps out and sacks Kangaskhan for some reason. I don't know what's going on anymore. But the deer finishes off the Lax, and I defeated sexy Mel. We're at the stage of the game where things get significantly easier. With the amount of encounters you get, it makes it so that you kind of have answers for almost everything. So to play safely, team building for boss battles end up being snagging 6 mons that counter the enemy and give them max bulk and HP. And then you play a very defensive playstyle that I like to call pass battling. You protect to get rid of the cheat AI, attack the enemy Pokemon, switch to the counter, and suck a dick. If you want to be extra efficient, set up a couple hazards and give leftovers, and you're basically unstoppable. The only issue here is that past battles take like 500 years to beat. So rather than me commentating over these boring ass fights, I'll just say that I'll just beat them with past battling. Because no one wants to see literal 5,000 turn Pokemon battles that are literally just attack and switch. It's boring as fuck. Don't worry, it gets better though, because after this Marlin and Maxima fight, we get to see something that sets Unbound apart from other Pokemon games. Slidey puzzles. Honestly, I spent way too long trying to complete this children's puzzle. Wait. Uh... No, 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 no. F it. But at the end of the day, we eventually got it. Please, 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 please. Yes, finally. Holy sh Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh f it. it. That took way too f Oh my god. Okay, now is where Unbound is truly different. Because this game features a thing called Boss Wild Pokemon, where these Pokemon have smarter AI, maxed out EVs in every stat, and they spawn with stat buffs. It's kind of like those totem Pokemon in Gen 7, but much harder. So you really got to think up some complex strategies to get past these guys. Plus, a bunch of moves like Perish Song and Destiny Bond are banned in this fight, so you really can't cheese it. It sounds simple, right? Wrong. This ain't Pokemon Unbound pussy mode. So let's take those wild boss Pokemon and replace it with a legendary. Oh, and let's also give these guys some good moves. Not only that, let's give these guys an Omni Boost. Wait, 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 that shit's still too easy, you say? Let's make it a back to back to back of all the legendary dogs and you can't heal in between. Surely that will make your panties wet in the ocean. After a bit of careful planning, here's what I've come up with. Raikou is first up, and I lead with Embor, which really isn't for this fight, so I switch into Quagsire on the Thunderbolt. With Quagsire's unaware ability, it doesn't really care about the Omni Boost, so I haze it to make it safe for everyone else in the back. Then I recover to get back to full HP and swap into Whizcash to Earthquake this thing down. Next up is the Entei, and this is why I lead with Embor, since this is the hardest dog in my opinion. Embor stalls out Entei's Stone Edges with Protect and Bulk Up, while putting this thing to sleep. Embor takes his opportunity to set up more until Entei starts to use HP Grass. Now that Embor is set up, we now start to bulldoze this thing down. Last up is a Suicune, so we pivot through Lantern to get Quag in. Quagsire tanks a Scald and set up another Haze, removing the Omni Boost again. Then we pivot through Lantern to get Crobat in to get a Toxic off. And now Lantern stalls this thing down and that's a GG. She was a bit of an effort, but we aren't done yet, because now we have another back-to-back -back wild boss fight with a fucking Ho-Oh and a Lugia. But instead of getting an Omni Boost, they get plus three defense and a plus two on their primary offensive stat. Not only that, you know those raid shield thingos in Sword and Shield? Well, these guys also have them as well. So after cooking up a bit more in the lab, here's what I could come up with. I leave Quagsire in the Ho-Oh to take a Brave Bird and to get a Haze off. Then I go and sack Charger Bug to get a free switch into Claydol. Since Claydol gets multi-scale in this game, it can tank another Brave Bird and set up a Reflect. Then I swap into Golem and started to break down the shields with Brick Break. And then Golem finished off this bird with Rock Slide. Now for the Lugia. Quagsire leads again and goes for a Haze. Then I swap into Golurk on an Air Slash and start breaking down the Rage Shields. Then I swap into Crobat on an Earthquake and land a Toxic. And now it's a ticking time bomb until Lugia dies to Toxic. Luckily, we got out alive somehow, and we get transported into a place called the Cube. And you guessed it, another f***ing puzzle. After meeting up with my father, we get transported into a place where we face one of the hardest fights in the game. Remember Mr. James Bond that we s***ed on with Clef? Well, he's back now, with a much stronger team than before. Plus, this is a tag fight with that Volcano Tag guy. Oh, you want to hear something so sick? This f***ing... Dickhead leads with an Intimidate Crook, which not only triggers Bishop's Defiance ability, but it's also holding an Adrenaline Orb. So the Bishop has plus one attack and speed off rip. 
So, your natural instinct would be to one-shot the bishop instantly, right? Well, there is another issue with that. Because Marlin's Crook is EV in a specific way where it has a 60% chance to trigger Life Art Citrus Berry and its Unburden gets activated. So depending on what the Crook rolls, it can affect the rest of the battle. Keep in mind, you can only bring three Pokemon and Vega's shitty little negative energy is present in this fight. But rather than killing the Bishop turn one, allow me to show you a more unorthodox way of doing this. I lead the fight with Wishy Washy, and thanks to the fact that the partner's AI knows what you're clicking, I click Serp, which forces Crook to protect and Bishop wastes this move. This allows the big washer to kill both the chess piece and the cat. Then Spiritomb and Absol comes in, and the big washer kills Absol while doing massive amounts of damage to Spiritomb. Drapion comes out, and Cacton protects while Big Dick Washer fucks even more. Now Honchkrook comes out, so I swap out the Goaded Washer and switch into Drapion. Then my Drapion kills Vega's bug, and Clefable kills off the rest. Oh, uh, thank f that's over, but now we gotta face another boss wild Pokemon. Primal Groudon. But the best part is, is that we can't control our own Pokemon. Because for some reason, we can't climb over this small wall of rocks and all my Pokemon are a mile inside. So now we gotta prep for a battle that we don't have control over. Fortunately, we got the best Groudon killer in the game, Donphan. By only teaching Donphan Endeavor and Ice Shot, the AI luckily knows how to use the Fear Strat. Get the f out of here Groudon. And now for everyone's favorite part of a Pokemon game, the evil base infiltration to go and beat the team shadow leader Zeph. So four hours of pass fighting later, we get a cute little backstory about Zeph using Hooper to revive his dead son or something. Who the f cares? Anyways, now we're facing the hardest gym leader in the game, Mr. Mad Scientist Galavan. This is a demonic double battle full of electric and steel type Pokemon. But the f thing is, is that this has permanent magnet rise for all electric and steel types, which removes this guy's only weakness. Not only that, there's also permanent electric terrain, so his electric moves are gonna hit extremely hard. Plus, just like Sexy Mel, Galavant's Minetric is pre burnt so that his flare boost is always active. The main idea for this fight is to pivot around lightning rod Pokemon, like Lantern, to avoid getting hit by electric type moves. But at the same time, you gotta be careful with the Mega Ampharos because Mold Breaker can go through Lightning Rod. Plus, with the severe lack of double battles in this game, you really don't know how the AI is gonna behave in this sort of setting. So you just gotta hope for the best. I lead with Infernape and Golem. Turn one, Ape fakes out to break Sash while Golem kills Raichu with a Dark Gem Sucker Punch. Meanwhile, Kling Clang sets up. Minetra comes out, so I swap into Lantern to take a gear grind and suck in the electric move while Infernape burns down the gears with Flamethrower. Heatran comes out, so Ape Mark punches the Heatran to not trigger his berry while Minetra and Heatran go for spread moves and Lantern gets some damage off with Brine. Minetric goes in for another Snarl while Ape and Lantern kills both Heatran and Minetric. Now the big bad boys come out, so I swap in to both my ground types to avoid the electric move while Metagross brick breaks the Whizcash. At this point, I need to sack one of these guys to get Rebombian, so Golem and Whizcash get some chip in before Golem dies and Whizcash tanks a crit steel roller. Rebombi comes in and I swap out Whizcash for Ludicolo while Rebombi kills Ampharos and Metagross steel rolls Ludi. I swap Infernape into the B slot while Ludi goes in for a fake out. And finally, Infernape kills the Metagross and that's probably the cleanest Galavan fight we're gonna get. Okay, now that the hard part's over, we can now chill and do some exploring. Honestly, this map is huge, so there are a variety of locations that you can explore. Especially now with the access to surf, because you can see things that you've never seen before in a Pokemon game, like this couple having sex in the ocean. This is also the only game where you'll see pirates taking down a mountain and giving birth to literal demons. What the actual f***? Just so you know, these little shits are ghost dark Pokemon with Wonder Guard. So if you somehow make it this far without a fairy move, you're pretty much just f***ed. Plus, these kids have maxed out EVs on everything, and they have an Omni Boost. And to top it all off, there are a f*** ton of them. After saving the world from a devil takeover, we get a massive lore dump about evil dudes being our parents' rivals or something. Who the f*** cares? Now we gotta do a fight with the main villain in the game, Akla. So we're back to 5,000 turn pass battles. This game is so goddamn fun. Now that we beat Aklov, this dude turns into a little bitch and teleported us to the distortion world. And not gonna lie, this distortion world is so much cooler than whatever Game Freak shout out. But as we go to a new place, you know we gotta do another insanely hard puzzle. 
Anyways, we got another wild boss fight with an omni-boosted Giratina. But here's the problem. Since we got teleported into Distortion World, we don't have access to our PC. So pretty much, we're stuck with the six Pokemon that we used to beat Aklav with. But fortunately, I had Tentacruel. So basically, if I give this squid a Focus Sash, we can Mirror Coat this guy. All we have to do is dodge Thunderbolt Paralysis. Please, for the love of God, do not paralyze, okay? Let's go! Anyways, let's continue our adventure, but before we fight the next gym leader, there is a little side quest that we gotta do first. Since we arrived at the slums that's infested with gang members, we're gonna go fight the gang leader himself. Black Embor James. This Mandy squad is said to have taken his Embor to ruthlessly bend over civilians and take all their prized possessions. But for the justice of the people, I shall defeat him. For all those who have fallen and to take back what is rightfully ours. So another 5,000 turn pass battle later, Black Embor James has been defeated. But for real though, the main reason to beat this guy is to get an Alolan Grimer Egg, which is very useful in the future. Anyways, now we get to the cool shit. This next gym leader has one of the most creative gimmicks I've ever seen in a Pokemon game. Meet Big Mo. This guy's a fairly scary team on paper. But the coolest thing about this fight is that his gimmick is Trick Room. But not any ordinary Trick Room, but Trick Room that's determined by your weight. So the heavier you are, the faster you are. So for all the Americans out there, this is your time to shine. But as cool as it is, this is just another boring ass pass battle. Anyways, a bit more traveling later, we get to a rather interesting place called Coots Bog. Some call it the heart of Boreas. There are many wonderful species and crops native to that region. They say that the Carnivine in Coots Bog are the tastiest in all of Boreas. The annual Carnivine Festival is usually the largest tourist event of the year. Winning the strongest Carnivine competition is a cherished prize in Coots Bog, and many people train for it year round. Oh shit, it's a f Stunfisk. Anyways, as we traverse through Coots Bog, we make it to Magnolia Town, where this lady can supply us with eggs. And these eggs contain some pretty cool Pokemon, like the Kanto starters, the Kalos starters, and a bunch of other random sh**. And as per standard Nuzlocke rules with eggs, where you hatch the egg is the met location, and not where you obtain the eggs. The only issue is, is that these eggs are hella expensive. $10,000 for an egg? Are you f insane? So after a shit ton of slave work, we went on a massive egg hatching sim to get some pretty broken Pokemon. A hundred K for a f***ing pizza. Go suck a dick. What the f***? Okay, now for the next gym leader, Tessie. She has a fairly standard team, but she also has the most fun gimmick in this game, Camomons. This is where your Pokemon's type changes, depending on the first two moves on the Pokemon. So a Tornadus is Dark Flying and the Seeking is Water Steel. This affects you as well, so planning for this fight requires you to look through all of your Pokemon and see what resources you can use. Luckily, abilities stay the same, so Pokemon with Volt Absorb and Water Absorb are very overpowered. Oh, and she also has permanent heavy rain. You know, this fight would have been so sick if it didn't have this goddamn annoying AI. Like, holy sh**, I'm getting so sick of these pass fights. Anyways, we now approach the hardest part of the game. Welcome to Crystal Peak, a mountain infested with some evil dudes and shiny rocks growing on the walls. There's a lot to cover here, so please hold on tight. First up is a tag wild boss fight with an omni boosted Zekrom and Reshiram. Thanks to Turbo Blaze and Terra Vault, Quagsire's unaware doesn't do anything here, so hazing it is out of the picture. So the only thing that I could come up with is send out Gastrodon with the Focus Sash and Mirror Coat Reshiram. But the issue with that is, is that I have to hope that Zekrom targets my partner's two cannon. Luckily, everything went according to plan and Zekrom gets shit on by my Steelix. Now Ivory comes in out of nowhere and bitch slaps her partner. And thanks to, uh, plot armor or some shit, I don't know what it's called. I had to avenge my partner by being forced to use three of these shitty little Pokemon to beat Ivory's full-on death squad. Like, what in the world is this bullshit? There are many issues with this situation. All of my rival's Pokemon are hooked up with dog movesets, so I gotta think about what three Pokemon I could bring to carry this fight. Not only that, Ivory's Toxapex has Regenerator, which makes this AI extra horny to spam recover and swap out. This results in this battle literally taking f***ing forever. Like, it's got to the point where I had to completely PP stall the Toxapex to win. So, this fight literally took 40 f***ing 
fucking minutes. And that's with emulation speed up, by the way. This is not fun. Okay, now for some hype shit. After getting to the top and a massive lore dump, we are faced with a pretty difficult challenge. This is a double battle with a Hooper Unbound and a fucking Mega Rayquaza. Not only that, they're both Omni Booster as well. But here's the f part. If we kill the Mega Rayquaza, the Hooper will just spawn another one. So ideally you want to kill the Hooper first, right? Well, think about this for a sec. If you double target the Hooper, you have a full on Omni boosted Mega Rayquaza on the other side bending you over. So you gotta plan carefully on how to take these guys on. Oh, this isn't over yet. After you beat these two straight away, without healing, you are forced to fight a Dynamax Hooper Unbound with five raid shields that can regen in the middle of the battle. Not only that, this giant Hooper can randomly attack twice in one turn and can randomly remove all stat changes on the field. There's just so much shit happening all at once, so you gotta pay attention to literally everything that is happening. So basically, you gotta use six Pokemon to beat two uber buff Digimon, plus a giant handjob machine wearing five condoms while on a shit ton of DMT. This is so fucking fair. I lead with Weaver and Crobat first. Turn one, I predicted that the Hooper would protect, so I fake out the Mega Ray and Crobat uses Haze to remove the Omnibus. Turn two, I called the Hooper to double protect, so Weavile uses Fame to break the protect and Crobat uses Bug Gem Mutant to one-shot the Hooper. And I swap in Steelix on the Dragon Ascent. Now that the Hooper is dead, it can't summon more Rayquazas, so Weavile and Steelix finishes it off. Okay, now for the Dynamaxed Hooper. And it turns out that swapping in two Poison Dark types can shit on this thing. Anyways, after Aklum's plan to destroy the world failed, we now have to fight him as a tag fight with our rival. And this prick has a pretty terrifying team, rocking demons like Tapifini and Primal Kyogre. Plus, this stack attack is set in a specific way that when it kills something, Beast Boost increases the attack rather than the defense. So, if it gets Trick Room up, this thing will shit on everything you put in front of it. But remember when I said that Larvitar is the best starter for the hardest part in the game? I picked it not necessarily to use Tyranitar for this fight, but mainly for my rival to use his Mega Metagross for this fight. Because the other rival starters aren't gonna f as much as Metagross. So picking Larvitar was a long con to give my partner extra firepower to pop off in Crystal Peak. So allow me to show you if this decision was worth it. I lead Crobat because with its inner focus ability, it should force the Tokyo Demario to fake out two cannon, which gives me an easy insta kill on the Gardevoir. Now Stack Attacker comes out and Crobat U-turns out getting chip on the castle while Tokyo Demario gets a nuzzle on the bird and the big stack sets up Trick Room. Now that Mega Steelix is in, body press is a range to kill the Stack Attacker. So we dodge Rock Slide Flinch and... <gasps> kill, 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 kill. Now this is looking really bad. Even though Metagross is in, this f***er doesn't have bullet punch, so I have to try and kill the stack attacker. Uh -huh. Stack attacker, please die. I need you to die here, man. <laughs> Don't flinch! Okay! The f***ing stack attacker died! Now Toga Demara comes back in and I have to swap out to Lantern for the Origin Pulse and Metagross does something insane. Oh my god, Metagross avoided that sh Then I thunder the Kyogre and this f***ing Metagross for some reason aims for the Iron Ball over the f Kyogre on the field. Yeah, you deserve to get wet, you little slut. Now that Tapifini and Kyogre's on the field, this is looking very scary. Kyogre uses Origin Pulse again, killing the Metagross while Tapifini uses Icy Wind and Lanta does some more damage with Thunder. Now Vaporeon comes in. Kyogre goes for Thunder on Vaporeon, but it's Wakenberry weakens the blow. Tapifini halves my health while Vaporeon kills off the Kyogre and Lanta does some massive damage with Thunder. Now we're in an awkward position here. With the rain gone, Lanta has to hit a 70% accurate Thunder or else we wipe. Lantern, you son of a bitch. F***ing hit. Okay.
Oh my f***ing god! Thank you, Lantern! Now, with all the threats I've dealt with, Crowback can finish off this battle. Okay, that battle was a little spicy, but we aren't done yet. Now that Akov's plans were destroyed and the police arrived to f*** everyone off, my f***ing rival, for some reason, wants to prove to his sugar daddy how strong he is by fighting alongside me. Like, I'm sorry, but as much as I love all the cool stuff in this game and playing through it has been such a treat and whatnot, but f*** me, man. This writing is way worse than the entire plot of Human Centipede 3. Like, please, just say that you want help defeating your sugar daddy, because last I checked, your sh**ty little two cannon isn't gonna f*** up his crackhead of a team. That being said, this is the hardest fight of Crystal Peak. Like, the Sableye burning everything combined with heavy hard hitters like Beedrill and Niveltal will definitely rupture your ass if you don't prep accordingly. There are only a select handful of Pokemon that actually pop off here, but even then, the chance of wiping is still extremely high. So, I did what many people dare not to do, think outside the box and thought of a strategy that just might work. All right, here we go, boys. All right, here's the plan. It's gonna be a very stupid plan, but it could work. We're literally toxic stalling this whole, the whole thing. I mean, what could go wrong? Bulldoze, toxic, protect, toxic, protect, toxic, protect, bug by the heel, protect, die, protect, and finally, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we actually beat Crystal Peak! <laughs> now we're officially in the end game, so let's speed run to the finish line. We quickly finished hatching all our eggs and played a cool little safari game before we tackled the eighth and final gym. Meet Benjamin. This dude is meant to be a bug type gym leader, but last time I checked, Magnazone isn't a bug. But the best part of this fight is that the gimmick is the Benjamin Butterfree metagame. If you don't know what that is, it's basically when a Pokemon's health reaches zero, it doesn't actually die, but instead it de-evolves into their pre-evolution. A Pokemon officially dies when their first stage Evo gets knocked out, which is cool in concept, but realistically, it eventually turns into your fully evolved Pokemon beating up children. But who cares, this is just another boring ass fight. Anyways, we now set our sights on the Pokemon League, but as the same as every Pokemon game, you gotta go through a gauntlet of trainers in Victory Road. I mean, these guys aren't too hard, like they have some garbage stuff like Chatod, so no one could really lose their run here. Except to maybe these two mega trainers, cause these guys have a demonic sun team as a double battle. But I just destroyed one side then the other, and then we get to the true hardest part of Victory Road. Oh really, I see what you did there. Oh god, I see what you mean the hardest part. Anyways, we made it to the Pokemon League and beating this challenge is right at our fingertips. The only thing that's stopping us is the Elite Four. But this Elite Four isn't like any ordinary Elite Four. Each member has their own custom gimmicks and their teams are built around using their gimmicks to their full advantage. Let me explain everything that you need to know. As soon as you enter the Elite Four, your stat scanner disables you from learning any moves that aren't TMs. Because obviously you don't have access to any tutors in the Elite Four. Although changing EVs is still fine, since legally you can do it with vitamins and berries. And just like Gen 5, you can choose what order you want to face each member of the Elite Four, which is very helpful when planning with these moveset limitations. Now then, allow me to introduce you to the Elite Four. Meet Elias, a zombified businessman that closes deals with the dead. The scariest part of his team is the Mega Gengar with Shadow Tag, where this thing can lock me in and kill anything that is presented in front of it. So I gotta be very careful about my switches. Plus, the Martian has a Z Crystal, and this is the first time we see Z moves in this game. The problem here is that I don't f***ing know how the AI behaves with Z moves, so I just gotta pray and hope for the best. Not only that, Elias' gimmick is called Shadowy Veil. This is where all ghost types have multi-scale and they won't take damage from hazards at full HP. So if something in the back has full HP, 90% of the time they can come in and take a hit. Now introducing Arabella, a fairy princess that has a bunch of daddy issues. This little bitch has a bunch of terrifying fairy Pokemon that can set up and sweep your whole team. Especially that Xerneas. If that thing sets up a Geomancy, you're pretty much just f***ed. Plus, her gimmick is permanent Misty Terrain to boost her fairy type moves and Pixie spawn around the battle which gives a plus one boost to all fairy Pokemon's weaker defensive stat. 
For example, her Tokyo's has weaker defense than special defense, so the pixies will increase Tokyo's defense as soon as she enters battle. This makes it so that everything is significantly harder to kill. Next up is Mole Man, a dude that is raised underground by some moles. This dickhead is a double battle with a bunch of terrifying ground type Pokemon. His gimmick is called Vicious Sandstorm, which is like normal Sandstorm, but after each turn it does 1 8 damage instead of 1 16. Plus, ground types get the 50% special defense boost along with rock type. Which is f***ing stupid, cause that means I can't one shot shit like Gliscor, but it's not like you're gonna hit it anyway with its Sand Veil and Bright Powder. And don't even think about clicking a water move in this fight, because Mr. Storm Drain Gastrodon can come in and f*** you over. Now for the most bullshit fight in this game, meet Penny an expert weave for dragons and another double battle. She has the most terrifying team so far in the Elite Four. And just like Elias, she also has Z moves that I have no idea when she'll click. Plus, you probably noticed the amount of Pokemon with secret power here. Well, in this game, secret power has a 30% chance to give yourself an Omni Boost. When combined with a gimmick that is dragon types get permanent Serene Grace, this equates to every single f***er having a 60% chance to Omni Boost every time they click secret power, which is absolutely in the head. Finally, the champion Jax fight. There's a dull battle with the most f***ed thing in existence. The opponent having illegal EVs is brutal, especially when it's on a f***ing Mega Rayquaza that is getting boosted by coaching. But luckily Jax doesn't have a gimmick for this fight. This Elite Four is one of the hardest series of boss fights in any Pokemon game. You have to plan for these fights very carefully, but even then you still have to adapt to everything that happens throughout the battles. The fact that I've been playing ultra defensively throughout the whole game really f***s me over here because I cannot use pass battling to save my ass. Plus, with the severe lack of double battles prior to the Elite Four, I just gotta pull something out of my ass for this one. So after a straight week of planning and banging my head, I present to you the six representatives that I will take to battle. Venusaur. This frog will absolutely sh** on Arabella. It can also provide us some leech seed support for the other guys and is a grass type that can kill Mole Man's Gastrodon. Milotic. This is a special defensive tank that has access to Haze to remove any stat boost. Not only that, with its multi-scale ability, it can switch into any move and can restore itself with Recover. Incineroar. Since there's a lot of double battles going forward, we gotta think like a VGC player. This cat having access to Fake Out, Intimidate, and switching moves like U-Turn and Parting Shot is very useful for this fight. Plus, with its dark typing, it can shit on Elias. Our big starter Tyranitar. This monster has incredible bulk and it can hit really hard. Plus, with Sandstream, it can get rid of Elias' multi-scale and can f hard against Mole Man. Golurk. In this game, this Titan gets Power Spot, which is insane for outputting a ton of damage in the dull battles. Plus, with its ghost typing, it can take advantage of Elias' Shadowy Veil. Last but not least, Big Vanillux. This ice cream will shred Penny to pieces. Its access to Snow Warning combined with Blizzard makes it so that it can do a ton of damage to both dragons on the field. Plus, it can go hard on Mole Man as well, and can mirror coat something if it needs to. This right here is the squad that will lead me to victory, and end the torture of Pokemon Unbound. Whether or not we win, I am proud to make it this far. So then, ladies and gentlemen, let's fucking do this. Up first, we have Penny, and I came up with a plan that sweeps her in four turns. All right, lads, here we go. We high horsepower the Dialga. Vanillax, please, for the love of God, hit the fucking range. Okay! Oh my god! Oh. It's fucking free! Okay, we help the hand. Ellie Blizzard, Kyrim, 
Use secret power and not kill the Golek. We're choice scarf. We're faster than the choice scarf tower engine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. It's done. It's done. It's done. She's done. Why is my audio just like being weird? Helping hand, Blizzard. I mean, boost didn't matter. Helping hand, Blizzard would have killed with the boost. You know, I want to see the Z move of this, um, like the animation of the Z move of this Como. First dead. Penny boys, that's how we like it. Next up is Arabella, and basically Mega Venusaur shits on most things. We use Leech Seed to encourage the AI to swap, so we can snipe a few things that swap in. Then my loaded PP stalls the Marwas play roughs, and we make some pretty good predictions. Okay, please! Switch out. Switch, 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 switch. This is this is perfect. 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 Okay. Please, for the love of God, be geomancy. Please, geomancy here. Goodbye, Xerneas. Then the rest of the battle is just a Mega Venusaur Massacre. That's two down. Two more to go. Now it's time for Elias, and this fight was a little bit troublesome. Since the Mars Shadow is a lead, I prayed that it would Z-move turn one. <laughs> we better get the Z-move here, boys. We better get the Z-move or this is going to be so fucked. Here we go. Okay, let's go. That, 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 was a, that was a pretty good uh, animation, if you ask me. Then we pivoted between Golurk and Incent to start PP stalling Marshadow's close combats. And when the Marshadow was at minus two attack, I sniped the switch to Giratina. 
I'm gonna predict that this is gonna switch here. It's been to like three times. So keep in mind, he still has three more. There's a switch. Okay, that's that's fine. Give it to Oh, this is super fine. This is actually fine. Then we got its health a bit low, so I can U-turn on the turn it uses rest. I'm gonna U-turn here in case it goes for rest. But even if it doesn't, it's a slow U-turn. Um, and we're fine. Yeah, there's a rest. That's fine. This is super fine. Shorts, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome in. How are we doing? Then Vanillix got some damage off before we go back to more PP stalling. Milotic Toxic stalls the Cofagrigus, and after a bit of switch sim, we get into this pretty sketchy situation. This is gonna rock side cheat AI on that. Or switch out. <sighs> this is uh, kind of a monka. How much is Gengar doing to me? There's a 12.5% chance that Sludge Wave crit kills me. I think we have to U-turn here. Wait, does... Wait, does U-turn contribute to the cheat AI? If it does, then it's then we have to protect. Because cheat AI is active right now. I mean, if we protect, we go to max health. And we're never dead to Sludge Wave crit. Yeah, I don't think, uh, there's like no reason not to protect Hey, Then we just get a protective. Okay, we got a U-turn here. That was a high roll as well. <sighs> but at least we break its multi-scale. Please stay in. Nice! I don't have to worry about the shitty Gengar ever. After a bit of pivoting later, Taranto kills the Blissephalon, Venusaur kills the Jellison and Marsha, and Incineroar kills the Giratina. I wonder, will it rest or will it just accept defeat? Ah, it just accepts defeat. Nice. Oh, that's three down, boys! Now for Mole Man, and in my opinion, this is probably the hardest member of the Elite Four. My dumbass couldn't think of anything for this guy, so I resorted to do what I do best. Lads, I'll be honest here, boys. We've got to hit blizzards in the fucking sand and against a bright powder sand veil Gligar. Let's see if this works. Here we go, boys. Time to wipe! Let's fucking go! High horsepower of this! Mega Revolve! Rock Slide! Nice! Okay! Nice, we hit both. Wait, we didn't hit Aerodactyl? Oh no! Well, this is gonna be Monka. We gotta protect. This is this is gonna be cliff lights.
Interesting. The thing is, I need fucking Golurk to stay in. Like, Aerodactyl's going for Rock Slide here, or, um, dual wing bait, and maybe pop my air balloon, and then Groudon's going for, like, yeah, Cliff Lights, because it's Choice Band. I need to kill this fucking Aerodactyl. I think this is the play. There's the Cliff Lights. Actually, this could be fine. This could be fine. This could actually work out, maybe. We hit the blizzard and then we, I don't know, knock off something. Unlucky. Uh, yeah, this is a throw. If that thing keeps wide guarding, we're just fucked up. That's actually kind of what we wanted. All right, lads, let's hope it doesn't white guard. Let's hope it doesn't white guard, boys. What? We have a chance. Maybe we might have a chance. We might have a chance, boys. <laughs> if this thing fucking hits Goliath score, I'm just so surprised. Let's fucking go, boys. Here we go, boys. Ice cream, you better do your fucking job. And you always hit these. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, just don't kill anybody. Just don't kill anybody. Just don't kill anybody. Hold! No, we, okay, we, we can't, yeah, we lose. We lose to Jax here. We lose to Jax here. Hey, we beat Mole Man. Unfortunately, Mole Man took away our only Rayquaza killer, so losing to the Sleep Four was inevitable. There was something that I learned throughout this journey. With the amount of past battling that I've been doing, a feeling of regret is washing over me. I can't help but think all the times I took the easy way out, I missed many opportunities to learn. Now when I was faced with something serious, I feel ill-equipped and lost. The truth is, taking the easy path may seem appealing at first, but ultimately it leads to a lack of experience for the challenges that the game will throw your way. It's a bitter pill to swallow knowing that I could have done more to prepare myself. But I ain't gonna let this feeling overwhelm me cause I'll be back and I'll send this game to hell once and for all. I'll see you all on the other side.